Welcome to Under the Hood. I am Dr. Abstract, and in this episode, we're going to take a look at, just in general, what the Zim framework code looks like. So uh, rather than concentrate on anything specific under the hood, may as well show you around a little bit. Does that sound good? <laughs> All the parts. So you can find out what the Zim code looks like by going to code and then scrolling down or hitting the CDN right here. So this is the code that we code with right here and you can copy that if you so desire into a template and start working with it. But what we want to show you is under the hood what the Zim code looks like. So I'm scrolling down through some of our code features and right here is the CDN, the Content Delivery Network. It's hosted on Cloudflare. So if I press like that, it goes to our CDN. There's a few of the different modules. So this is what indeed the module code would look like. Let's zoom in on that a bit. Uh, which has some extra stuff to handle the module. But rather than look at that, let's uh, scroll on down. Here's the minified code right here. But we don't want to be looking through minified code because that looks like a bunch of garbly gook. And that's how big it is. So just past all the minified codes, which these Zim minified used to be just Zim. But then when we went to the module, we gave the module just Zim. And we adjusted the Zim minified code to have underscore min on here. And then down below are the docs. And all along, Zim has had Zim underscore doc for the docs version. And so there's a bunch of the docs versions. Okay, anyway, and there's a bunch of helper libraries that goes with Zim. Here's the create.js uh, code, docs version, etc. So that's all the stuff on the CDN. We would want to be looking through this latest docs, CDN version 00. When we went to Zim version Zim, we just dropped <laughs> the Zim directory there. So these are all the versions. So it used to be, well, they used to be numbered 10.8, 10.9, etc. Then we went to cat and it was cat, cat, cat. Then we went to NFT, NFT. And then we went to Zim version Zim. And uh, when we did that, we decided that it was probably going to be our last major version. Uh, we've done a lot of versions, you know, right from 7, 8, 9, etc. all the way. Up. By the way, uh, the, these ones just happen to be some of the versions that we're hosting on our CDN. It doesn't mean that we only had one version in 8.3. It's just at this time until I think, yeah, it looks like version 10.5 maybe and on. Um, we had been hosting on Amazon on CloudFront, not CloudFlare. So there's a whole bunch of versions still on CloudFlare as it says somewhere. But anyway, you don't need to worry about those. Those are all old. Uh, right now, we'd be wanting to take a look at Zim Docs. Well, we have that right nearby, so I, I don't need this at all. Here is my code in Atom, and here's our CDN with the 00, and there's the Zim Docs that we're looking through. There's also Zim Min right here, and Zim JS, which is the module version of this, as well as the other uh, modules, ES6 modules for physics, pizzazz, socket, etc. All these things, by the way, um, are made automatically by uh, a tool that we use that will then take just our Zim docs and turn it into everything else. So, oh, uh, we do the Zim min as well. So we manually compress, well, not totally manually. <laughs> we use another tool to manually compress our Zim into uh, minified code. But then those two are what are used to build the rest of these things uh, with the tool. So uh, along with our docs, so the docs as well are right here within the Zim doc. So this is our master version of Zim, you might call it. We also copy this over to GitHub, but, and that's another place that you could find it is on GitHub. And I suppose another place that we could have found the Zim is in the docs right here. Uh, at the top of the docs, we have use uh, modules or scripts, and there's the CDN and the code page. But here is Zim 00 minified and Zim 00 unminified. So if you press that, this is the document that we're looking at. So they're also available to peruse at the docs. 
Um, you can also find them if you go to, say, uh, a rectangle here. So I've opened up rectangle, and if I scroll on down to the bottom of the rectangle, there's one that says code. And so when I press the code, what it does is it takes basically the code that is in Zim and shows it to you here in the browser. So this is the code that would be found in the Zim rectangle. So you can examine any of the code. Some of this code is slightly modified. Um, we don't, uh, because uh, we're just showing some stuff here, we, did, we didn't show a few things built in, uh, the, the built-in parts to the docs that actually help make the docs. So when we make the docs, we just filter out those, um, they're like sort of slightly like delimiters, I guess you could call it, that would divide up the docs so that when we run, uh, we run a PHP script that does all that stuff for us. So we just run, run one script and in no time we have docs, we have all the ES6 modules and they're all ready to go. Okay, so uh, anyway, there's how to find it. Let's just take a look through the docs now. There's a lot of comments to start and, uh, you know, sort of about Zim and why we've built Zim the way that we do, as well as thanks to various uh, people that have helped or code that we've we've taken from various places, like the noise code. Um, that's primarily it. Uh, there is the synth um, play, not the synth synth, which is uh, which we all did, but uh, oh, sorry, synth uh, was called tone. Tone is when we make um, allow a bunch of parameters and do laws and all that kind of stuff. That's the majority of it. But play is a little uh, script that's put together by Frank Force here, and uh, that for the most part is it. We are storing things. So how, how Zim works is everything is stored on Zim. So pretty soon we're going to see Zim somewhere. Oh, these are globals. So globals are global. Uh, okay, well, let's, um, let's jump on down. So up here somewhere is a way to jump on down. So there's a bunch of modules. Wrap. But unfortunately, wrap comes first, and it's it's not stored on the Zim object. It's it's a global wrapping thing. It's things like our uh, Zog, for instance, just a global function that's always going to be global. Then we have the code module, the display module, the various methods that get added to the display things, the controls, the frame, and the meta. So note where the frame is. It's all built at the end. So this used to be the well, yeah, I guess it used to be our modules that would actually be modules that you could import individually. Eventually, we created Zim Distill, which is called tree shaking, I guess, where we can distill out only the code that the app uses and, or minify that. So modules became less important. And the modules were so big anyway that it was sort of awkward. And every, people who were using the framework, it's a framework, they were using all of them, all of the modules anyway. So it just became not really convenient to keep having separate modules. So we just do it all in one big file, but we've left the organization of that. However, for the docs, we've swapped the organization of that. Uh, wrap was a whole bunch of stuff. Well, why don't we pop up out to the docs and just take a peek at that. So I'll go to, up to the top. So here we're showing the frame first, display, then the methods and the controls. Wrap comes at the end as well as code. So code and wrap, you see if we if we scroll on down here, here's the frame stuff. The blue or greeny blue is display. Green is methods. The uh, controls are yellow. The code is orange. And so actually the code comes first in, in the code, but we don't wanna show this. A lot of this code is more generic. It's not even really, some of it's not related to Zim. It's like, um, we don't need Zim objects to make this code. These are like code, basic code that helps us like random and shuffle and stuff. Uh, and, and some even more basics. And then these are classes relating to the basics. So none of these use Zim con um, containers or display objects or anything like that. And then there's wrap. 
And these these look weird to start with rap. People would look at it and go, zum, zot, zop, zil. <laughs> you know, okay, is this Swahili or something like that? Like, what, what language are we working in here? So we moved rap to and, and code to the end of what we're displaying in, in the docs. However, in the actual Zim code, uh, they come first because we actually use some of that stuff as we progress. So those are basic things that we build upon as we build Zim. So they come first in, in the Zim code. Okay, so here we are in the Zim code. And this is saying that in the Zim code, if you wanna kind of hunt the modules, the modules all start with these many slashes here. So I'm going, I'm going to uh, copy those. Did I copy them? <laughs> Saw a V show up. And I copy them and do a little search here. And uh, there's 86 of them. So, well, there's the wrap. So that's why there's 86 of them is that uh, <laughs> it's used throughout. So that's Zim wrap. If I just move beyond that and then do another search, here's Zim code. So these are all the things that are right in, um, well, it's in, in our code, but not, not using any Zim stuff. So it's not um, quite the same as most of our Zim stuff. However, the format's roughly the same. We have, this is the start of our docs right there. That means it's a doc start. And if we scroll on down, this format right here is giving it a number. And this format right here is calling a little function and passing it that number. So this handles the docs, this part right here. And then as soon as we hit here, I'm actually in the code. So this is the code, this is the docs. By running this, this is used by distill. So that's a little function that just records in a variable the fact that chop has been used. So when we run distill, distill will reference that storage and know what commands were used. So in other words, to use distill, you've got to run your app and run everything in your app all of the code will be recorded in, in, in a variable. And if you run distill, or if you turn distill on, uh, actually maybe if it's you turn distill on, you've got to turn distill on and then it will run these. If, if this runs, but the very first line in here is, is distill on? If distill's not on, <laughs> return, go away. So basically it's just running nothing if, um, if distill's not on. Otherwise it does record. And then uh, running the distill function, distill round brackets, we'll then take that recording and put it in the console. You take that and paste it into the distill tool and it will then minify the code for all of the, those functions that you ran. That's the distill process. So that's what that is. And that's one of the things I, I guess that we take out when we show the code. There's no point in showing people this. And we're right into here. Um, before we actually look into what, what's happening in a function or a class or whatever, I want to continue on with the overview. So this is where we're calling the function. And that, this is the command right here that ends this, this thing. So that, that begins it in a sense. And this says, okay, that's the end of our code. And then we're on to another document entry of shuffle. So that's a system. All of the things that we would use in distill are sort of wrapped in this number right here. And distill will then collect that and, and all those parts and minify it all. And then the docs also use that breakdown as well to put this in the docs and divide it up into, if you want to see a little page later, it puts it in a page for you. All right, so there's the code. And now we're going to continue to look to see the next module is the display module, which is interesting for the most part. The display module also includes some fixes to local to global, global to local, and local to local. CreateJS, when they built CreateJS, Zim is built on CreateJS. And uh, things like local, global, etc. is handled by CreateJS as a part of the base. But um, CreateJS based all of its matrices on a stage that wouldn't scale. And then it turned out that it helps to scale the stage to the pixel ratio, the device pixel ratio, to get crisp vector results. If you don't, you don't quite get crisp vector results. So Adobe Animate 
realize that or maybe create just it. I don't know who did, uh, but uh, when Adobe started publishing uh, with Adobe Animate, which used to be Flash, they started publishing to HTML5 and they use CreateJS to do so. They pay attention to the device pixel ratio, which scaled the stage. So that broke all of the local to globals and global to locals for things like uh, locating mouse positions and stuff. So we fixed that with um, uh, this sort of system here, I guess. Mm, I'm not sure what is it in there that did it, but something in there fixed all of these things. Uh, oh, we may have fixed our version of CreateJS as well. So it's kind of a hybrid system where Zim will work with somebody else's version of CreateJS. And because in our version of CreateJS, we put in a special variable and Zim will read that special variable and decide which way to handle things. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you don't need to, to know too much about that. But I'm just saying that we start off our display with these um, uh, local versions of these functions, basically. Then there's a display base, which is, the problem is, is we, we don't have control over the CreateJS container. And it's very, a container is very handy. So most of the objects in Zim will extend the container because any, well, any, most of the display objects will extend a container. That's the base thing that we would use for say a button or something like that. Well, we don't have certain, and we don't have access to the container. We could go in and modify CreateJS, but that, that's not all that easy to do. And then it would go further away from the original CreateJS. So for instance, we want to apply a width and a height and width only and height only to everything. And is that it? And a level and a depth. So these are methods, blend mode, a name, draggable, and I think that's about it. Oh, nope, some effects as well. So all of that stuff right there, uh, we're in a sense extending a container um, to do that to some degree, or we're applying these things to the CreateJS container uh, or to the Zim container. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. And then, then all of our thing, the Zim container extends a CreateJS container. And then the, uh, these things get added to it. I think that's how it works and then a button will extend the, the Zim container. Okay, so anyway, these are located up in this module as well. And then we have a GD, which is used internally, internally to dispose objects. So this was helpful in disposing objects. So we use that across the way. And here we are starting with our traditional uh, in the docs, if we take a look at the docs here, in the docs under display, we start with stage. So stage and stage GL, we never really use because frame uses those. So we made them available here because you know we have them made, but really uh, if you make a new frame, it will make a new stage for you. If you make a new frame and pass in WebGL or a GPU, I think it is, a GPU parameter, say true, then it will make a stage GL for us rather than a stage, but um, they're in there anyway. And then we start with the basics of container, shape, bitmap, sprite, movie clip, uh, SVG containers kind of thrown in there, but it's not a basic really. So th those ones are the basics that came from CreateJS, but then uh, we needed to touch up a few things. So Zim, we have, um, we have extended those um, are inherited. I don't know what it was called. Well, whatever. We extended them and we're inheriting from uh, the CreateJS versions. We would move into our specific shapes. See, if you hit circle, for instance, it says Zim class that extends a custom shape. The custom shape itself extends a Zim container, which extends a CreateJS container. So that's sort of how it works. A little while back, we realized we had we were making all these shapes like circles, rectangles, triangles, etc., and a lot of them had many things in common. So we made this thing called custom shape, which all of our Zim shapes will inherit those things that are in common. Uh, things like uh, I don't know, setting borders and colors and stuff. So. Uh, and then those things are what extend a, extend a container. 
Originally, we didn't have this. You know, this was introduced in, I don't know, Zim Neo or Zim 10 or something like that. Originally, we didn't have it, but that caused a lot of repetition of code. And the more, the more shapes we made, we, uh, it was when we made a polygon. Yeah, we got to Zim 10, we made a polygon, we made a line, and we went, oh, uh, for crying out loud, and a flare. These things are all the same as rectangles, circles, and triangles, and we're repeating all this code, so let's deal with that. And so we dealt with it at that time. Okay. So here is our stage. Um, and there's the docs for the stage. So there's this thing in Zim called um, Zob, Z-O-B, and it handles our... I don't think this one has it, though. No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so there's three or four things in each of our classes that we do over and over again. Stage isn't necessary. Stage doesn't have any parameters. It doesn't accept duo. So let's go to another one. I don't think it does. So under parameters, parameters, yeah. So if it accepts what we call the Zim duo technique, then it would say so here, and we'd be able to pass these parameters in as an object literal with properties that match the parameter names, a, sing a single parameter that's an object literal. So that's ZimDuo. Hopefully you've heard of ZimDuo. Uh, if not, then you know we'll introduce it a little bit here. As a matter of fact, we'd probably do an under the hood specifically on ZimDuo. It's a little complex and I'm not ready to do it now. But I can show you our those three things that I mentioned. One is ZimDuo. The other is Style. And what's the other? The other is ZimV values. Those are three main things that we do across many of the classes that are a little bit different than normal classes. Uh, oh, well, or that you know you, you would see in a normal class, I should say. But stage doesn't have it, so let's let's move along. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the, why don't we just go to button? So here's how I would operate that. I would do a find here and I would say zim dot button equals. So some people have sort of said, well, you know, how, why don't you use individual files? You can find those easier. And I sort of beg to differ. I find it just as easy. I don't have to go out to another directory, load another file, I have a bunch of files going on. I can quite easily jump around to my places just by doing that. We can also, if you're working in several places, I can easily set uh, one of these things. I go like this. Um, I can't remember how I do it. F1, there we go. So F1 leaves a bookmark, and if I'm somewhere else, so uh, like down here, and I just go F2, it pops me to that bookmark, so I can just move between bookmarks really easily. I can do find and replaces right here in the single file, rather than going into a bunch of files and doing find and replaces, or find and replaces across multiple files, which I find kind of annoying. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to work in one document. It's one document to zip up, it's one document to, well, not that I zip, what do I do? Um, minify, for instance. It's, uh, I, I find it easier to deal with one file by far. So uh, there's Zim button. If I find it again or hit the F3 again, here's the start of my code. And I can easily collapse that. That's like, there's all my code right there. Um, and here are parameters passing into a button. There's a fair number of parameters going into buttons. It's actually wrapped. <laughs> See that? It doesn't really wrap, but uh, the editor won't allow anymore, so it wrapped it. That's a single line. Um, then we have what's called a signature, which is we ran into a slight issue in the way that we handle Zim Duo. So this is the Zim Duo code right here, which allows us to pass in either code as parameters. Uh, normal parameters, in which case what happens is those normal parameters get picked up here and Zim Duo basically is ignored. It flows on through. Uh, however, if Zim Duo, this ZOB right here stands for a Zim object notation, so if a ZOB, if we pick up the fact that the first parameter is an object literal rather than not an object literal. So if there's only a single object literal being passed to it, then uh, that triggers the Zim Duo technique, and we're assuming now an, an, a 
configuration object is passed in. At which point, Zob, right here, Zob catches that. It will, it will disperse the object literal parameters to the correct parameter locations. So it takes from the object literal and it will match, oh, if the object literal said background color, then it knows to put it in the zero, one, two, three position as, and it recalls. So basically this will recall. So it just gets this far, figures it out, recalls the function with the parameters in the right place. Okay. Or recalls in this case, it's a class. So it remakes the class. Well, we ran into a bit of an issue in that uh, normally we would be able to parse out these things or know what those parameters are called. But if the file is minified, then we can't. So we scratched our head and went, oh crap, so minified doesn't work with Zimduo. Oh no, what are we going to do? So what we did is we had to recreate the parameter names here as a string. So, and then we pass the sig into the duo, and now the uh, Zim duo or Zob right here will know how to take um, your parameter names that you're using, which, which are really in your property names of your configuration object, and disperse them to the right places. Okay. So that's what this duplication is for, which is sort of too bad, but considering the convenience, it's uh, well worth it. And it's no problem, you just copy this and paste it into a string, really. Okay, so all of that is uh, at the top of any function or any class that uses Zimduo. This is used for the distill. And then these things right here are used for, for style. So we can pass in a special group which is like a class in CSS, but there's where we're collecting it. So these last three parameters are whether we want to use style or not. So we can override that by saying false, and then it, this uh, wouldn't use styles at all. We can know that it's part of a group, and we can also inherit um, styles. So what we're doing here is going off to get the styles for a button. We're passing in the group and whether we want to inherit it. So get style is sort of set up to, to handle um, how we can collect the styles from style. So in Zim, you can go style is equal to, and you can say color colon red like that. Uh, or you can um, pass in specifically that you want comma a button colon. We'll get these styles color in blue and then any buttons will have a color that's a text color of blue but everything else will be a color of red that just overwrote it or you could have done the uh, the group as well by saying group colon whatever which would override the button one okay so anyway uh, we can pass in styles this is us collecting those styles into a variable called ds uh, the styles <laughs> I don't know, I can't remember what the D means, but whatever. Um, we use these zots, which is a little bit awkward, and maybe maybe we should just go through and swap it, but we are uh, just playing it safe. I suppose zot is just one of those little um, global functions that we made, like zid, which is the same as document that get element by ID, but it's spelt zid. Uh, zot is really just if, width is not equal to null, it turns out. At the time that we built Zim, we had trouble discerning what we actually wanted to do to receive parameters. And that's changed a little bit in ES6 as well, because null is no longer, should be used for parameters, it should be undefined. But Zim is all ES5, so uh, with internally here, that works fine for us. So it's the same thing, it's a little shorter. <laughs> No, you know, that's not exactly why we did it. Why we did it is because we had some other tests in there and then eventually it distilled down or not distilled, but we figured out, um, oh, really, all we want to do is test for not equal to null and, and that will handle it for us. The, the issue there is we're, we're receiving um, default parameters in there if they passed in zero. So if we just said, if not width, you know, if, if, if this was our test, if not width, then that would mean that if we passed in zero for a width, well, width of zero might not be allowed anyway, but 
um, if zero were allowed, then it would be acceptable, or it would trigger a um, the default rather than actually use zero. So anyway, that's what Zot is. If you see Zot everywhere, we're basically saying if they haven't provided a width, then width is equal to whatever's in the styles width. Oh, sorry. If something's in the style width, then so yeah, okay. So if something, if there is something in the style width, then use the style width. Else use two hundred. Use the default. So um, in ES six, this would become width equals two hundred, kind of width equals two hundred. You know, you may have seen that. So that's a default for the width. The problem is that can't handle style. So you can't put this stuff. That's an expression. You can't put that in there. So if I take that, I can put that in there. It won't evaluate that in ES6. So we couldn't use ES6, even, even if we wanted to, like even if we went to ES6, we wouldn't be using default parameters here anyway, because we have to deal with style. So uh, that's us dealing with style. And anything that any parameter, which is usually all of our parameters for all parameters except the last three, which are same across all of them as well. These last three don't get put in style, I don't think, if I remember correctly. <laughs> be kind of meta. Um, anyway, all, all of our parameters on, I think almost all, yeah, I think all of our display objects except style for any of their parameters. Half of the half of the controls do as well. The problem is controls, only some of them, like a quarter of them, a third of them maybe, are display objects, because controls usually operate on existing display objects. But things like a tile, it does operate on existing display objects, but the result is a display object, that being a container that is the tile. So there's a mix. Some some of the controls aren't display objects and some of the controls are. And traditionally, we hadn't applied styles to the controls. But then um, a while back, we added them to... It, it turned out styles were so handy to be able to style uh, an emitter or um, a tile was handy. So we, we uh, styled most of them or some of them. I can't remember what the deal is there. But anyway, uh, what I was getting at is all of these can be parameters. And because of that, though it doesn't look like it here. Yeah, because of that, we have to, for each one, do this line. So that increased the size of Zim by 15K or something like that. It wasn't the end of the world, but we, we you know, we're, it was a little bit too bad that we had to, we couldn't figure out a cleaner way to provide default parameters see many many parameters you wouldn't even have to bother with the default you could just it doesn't matter like later you if they're not there you just don't use them but if you want to style it we always have to know if it's there or not because it might come from style so we, we even if we were passing i don't know if there's any examples here but even if we said this is null which is sometimes might happen uh, we want to collect the height from from the height style, even if we're going to pass along null if it's not there. You know, anyway, by default though, it is a height of 60. Okay, here's uh, another thing that is a little bit unique to Zim, uh, although it came from CreateJS, is how we deal with extending. So this is a button, and if you recall, the button extends a Zim container. So down at the bottom of the button. <laughs> I'm a button down at the bottom of the button is well I could have done a search on extend if I realized the button was this big. There's a fair bit in the button, huh? You like that? Now if I were in a page of its own, I could have just scrolled down to the bottom of the page, I suppose. But like I said, I could have gotten there by just doing a search for extend. Or maybe better yet, um, collapsing and putting my cursor at the bottom and uncollapsing. So there's extend. So it extends a zim button, uh, or sorry, a zim button extends a container. So this is the zim extend, which is very similar to the create js extend that they put in place to be able to extend ES5 uh, functions, um, which, you know, as classes. So we're not in ES6 here. So 
um, extending contain uh, extending um, functions was always a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, you can look back historically. There's many, 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 many posts and articles and arguments about how to extend and inherit and all that kind of stuff with ES5. Um, so CreateJS, uh, Grant Skinner there, made a really good uh, way of extending, but there were some things that we wanted to do to add to that. So we, <laughs> I don't know if you could call it extended, the CreateJS extend, but we rewrote it and um, here's what it looks like. We pass in what's going to be doing the extending and what are we extending. These are what we want to override. So we would want to override these. And what that just means is we're going to want to gain access to the super. So if you don't, if you want to override and don't need access to the super, you don't have to put anything in here. But we're going to override the dispose and still want to call the super uh, dispose. The way we get to the super is by this prefix right here. So whatever we put in here will be like super, uh, call this whatever. So zim, under, zim container underscore um, constructor will call the, the container itself. And then I can't remember what that, that means right there. So we're back up to button and so here is the um, us using that. That's basically calling the super constructor. So we're calling the container, passing in a width and a height. Uh, the zim container has width, height, x, and y as parameters, so we don't need to worry about the x and y for the button. And then I can't remember what the false is asking for, but so be it. We're setting the type to a button and continuing on with some um, some defaults here. Remembering, okay, so this this stuff here relates to ZimV values. We don't have to do this a lot, but uh, sometimes when you say make a container or when you make a tile of something, if you're using ZimV values, ZimV values are dynamic parameters, which means if we pass in an array of things, say an array of label names or something or uh, strings then it would randomly pick from that to make your button. Um, if you passed in a series of colors, for instance, then each button that gets made gets made from that series. Well, the problem is if you've got random things going on and you make a tile, then you tile it, it's going to randomize some stuff. Great. And, but then if you clone it, do you want it to clone the randomized stuff exactly or do you want it to clone again, randomized. So we ran into that issue and we had to sort of retrofit a little bit and go, oh gosh, you know, so anything that we would want to clone exactly rather than use the ZimV values, we have to sort of remember what the ZimV value or what it, what it was originally so that we can either go back to the original and randomize again, or we can use what the values from the ZimV values were and clone those values. So this will be matched up in the clone side as well. Uh, OA, OA here, I guess, gets used in the clone size. And all, all we're doing is sort of remembering certain ones of these. Only There are only certain ones that accept ZimV values in the docs. You can have a look at it. As you can imagine, it's not often you really want to randomize your buttons. Uh, but it happens a lot with circles and other things like that. All right. So... That was that system. And then we're still going back to some more. Uh, borders are a bit of a pain in the neck because you've got border width and border color. So you have to figure out if, if you provide a, just a border color, that means you get a default border width of one. If you provide just the border default of one, you get a default border color. But if you don't provide either of them, then you don't get the, both of them become nulls or whatever. So it's sort of tricky to handle. That's just a bit of uh, that stuff happening there. And that pretty well finishes it, I think, for a button. We may or may not have a label, so we're doing some stuff. Oh, uh, here we are then making a label. So if, if they haven't provided a label as a string or a number, then we're going to make a label for them. Um, and in doing so, we have to figure out we're, style, we're styling that. There we are saying, don't 
accept styles for that, but we're passing certain styles through to the label itself. That's how we've handled it. Because the question is, is if you apply some styles, do you want your button labels to receive those styles or not? And we decided that certain aspects of that we do, but certain other, other aspects we don't. And so this was us uh, deciding that in, inside how we were going to do that. Also passing some ignores through, which will, oh, I can't remember either ignore the styles or something, but anyway, so some style kind of issues in there. Yeah, we're still doing some parameters. Gosh, a lot of parameters in a button. Um, we're ES5, so, you know, the classic that equals this, because then inside any of these functions inside here, if there are, if there are private functions in a sense, uh, then this would be scoped to the, that private function rather than the object. So that we know is the object, and therefore inside of certain functions here, we use that. So here's a function set pattern, for instance. We use that. If we didn't, if we use this here, then this would refer to the not the object, but rather this function. So that was sort of like a classic ES5 issue. Uh, most of that is gone in ES6 now, but it's it's no big deal really, uh, aside from teaching it, which is very annoying. Although somewhat amusing, it becomes like a Monty Python skit. This and that, you know, you know don't put this, put that, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, who's on first or whatever. Um, what else is going on in here? Icons, roll icon settings. Uh, anything else we want to peek at? That was sort of an overview and uh, a kind of a scroll into this. There are, okay, yeah, let's, let's back out of looking in the class. At some point, we want to do an under the hood that relates specifically to the style stuff and one that specifically relates to Duo, we should probably take a look at how we do ZIC or ZIMV values, which has now been turned into PIC. But we started off as ZIC, one of those short little PIC things, and uh, we still use those internally. Um, so we should do uh, under the hood for each of those. Those are quite important. However, if you're interested in those already, there was some videos already done in bubbling called Golden Functions or something like that. We did a, a JavaScript conference presentation on some of those, and we called them Golden Functions. And I think I went through those presentations already, so you'd be welcome to look back and find those if you want. But just on the overall what's going on here. Why don't we take a look at, um, note that all of these things are stored on Zim, so Zim button, and also we've got Zim get style, and we've got Zim this and Zim that. Those are not Zim colors, those are quotes, So, but other ones will have Zim, that's not Zim colors. Usually I do use Zim colors, but this was uh, one of the first classes we did, and I had maybe, um, believed in Zim colors <laughs> at the time. But anyway, inside of here, if we were to make a rectangle, for instance, we use Zim in front. Outside, we generally don't need to use the namespace unless you turn it on so that you have to use the namespace. So that's what I want to show you now, how we dealt with that. But internally, anything that is relating to Zim, we put the namespace in so that if you decide to use the namespace, Zim will still work. <laughs> Um, otherwise, if and, and we have on occasion left these off, it's kind of hard for us to remember when we're constantly on the outside saying new rectangle. If we were to do that new rectangle, and if you turn the Zim namespace off, then it wouldn't know what this rectangle was. So uh, we went through, we did a, a ES linting and changed something like 2000 places where we maybe have forgotten the Zim namespace or we duplicated variable things. Most, most of that stuff was because we used duplicate vars, you know, like later we used another var that was an often with I, you know, the var I and another var I later on in the same scope. And ESLint is saying, you've got two var I's and we're going, oh, okay. Um, but anyway, it also caught a few places where we forgot to include the namespace internally. So that was quite nice. 
So how do we handle the namespace? All of this stuff, as you saw there, was stored uh, right, well, here, I'll find it this way, right on the Zim namespace is equal to this thing. So then what we do at the bottom uh, in the, a place called Zimplify, Zim, uh, I don't know if it's Zim.Zimplify, it probably is, Zimplify, so for Simplify it's not. Simplify, mm, that's distill. So Zimplify isn't stored on Zim, it's just loose. So there's Zimplify and what it basically does here it is right here it's not not all that much is as long as I, I suspect we actually call simplify at some point in our code probably right at the very bottom we basically say if there's not zim namespace oh if there is zim namespace so zns it's a global variable called zns for zim namespace if that's true then we call simplify so we probably find that in the next one there it is right there so it's right at the very end of Zim. That's the end of the Zim module right there. And here is if there's not Zim namespace, then oh, call Zimplify. Ah, right. We want to Zimplify if there's um, no namespace. So here's what Zimplify does then. Let's go back to it. Right here. It stores, um, it stores the global window class. This is JavaScript's window and the global blob class. It stores it on document.window and document.blob. Unfortunately, we have a window and a blob class. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that there was a blob class when I made Zim. <laughs> Oops. Uh, it turns out that's a way to store a bunch of image data or any, any data that's, I don't know. I don't know, is it any data? But it, it's like picture data, stuff like that, um, in a blob. Cute. Our blob is better, so it's much more blobby. <laughs> it's really a blob. So we decided not to adjust Zim at Zim fourth, maybe it was when we sort of discovered it. it was in fourth stage and we just kept using blob. So we need to give access to the, the window and the blob if needed. They're stored on the document. You can also run Zimplify and exclude those. So there, there, there's some techniques as they're quite described up in here as to how to do it. So there it is. Alternatively, ZNS can be set to true and then run Zimplify with window and blob set. And that way you won't, we won't, Zim won't overwrite the window in the blob class. But for the most part, works out just fine. Uh, so methods equals Zimify, get a list of methods. Ah, so we have a method called Zim, Zim or a function called Zimify, which turns all of our, uh, we had a bunch of functions in Zim. So how, how Zim grew is it was, a bunch of functions that helped us use CreateJS. So if you wanted to drag a CreateJS object, you would call zim.drag, you would pass in the CreateJS object, and then whatever drag parameters you wanted. So that was how you used to, to do it. You can still do it. So you can still say, you can still say drag circle, and it would be the same as circle.drag. Uh, so we made Zimify, and Zimify will turn all of those functions that used to work on CreateJS, turns all of those functions into methods of all of these new Zim classes. So there were a few Zim classes at the beginning, like a circle and a rectangle and a button, but now there's hundreds of Zim classes, including all of the things like a container. And so we didn't used to have a Zim container, but we... Um, overrode those now. And basically, so all those functions became methods in Zim fourth, fourth. That was the fourth version of Zim, Zim fourth. So they became known as Zim fourth methods. And uh, they're all the ones that you see here, basically. So these are the display objects. So there's circle, rectangle, triangle, label, etc. list all the components. Here are the methods. And these methods, so these base ones are sort of a cheat. Those are actually create JS methods, or we may have um, 
you know, modify them slightly. But those are CreateJS methods, basically, not the Zim fourth methods. We just decided to put them under Zim methods because a lot of people uh, would want to know that we could do those things. So those are very common ones that came from CreateJS. But these other ones right here are all um, Zim ones. These are the Zim fourth methods, and they're often chainable. Almost all of these are chainable, including, of course, the short chainables. So all these are chainable. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. And then we've got interactions like tapping and dragging and animate and wire and bind and gesture and like tons of stuff. Okay, as well as the hit tests. Uh, oh, and sorry, there's animate, pause and wiggle loop. And then general ones to mask and scale and stuff. So all of those methods are functions as well. But Zimify will turn all of those methods or sorry, all of those functions into methods. And that can be handy for you guys if you're using Animate out there, Adobe Animate, because that exports to CreateJS. So you would want to Zimify anything that you make in Animate that would normally be a CreateJS movie clip or something. If you Zimify it, it will get all of these things for you. So we set that up in what's called Zim Shim, and we show you how to do all that. And so you can follow that if you need to. All right. So Zimify have, has all our methods. I'm not sure why we wanted to. So getting this true right here will actually just use the fact that we're, we've got all the methods and grab all those methods from us. There are some exceptions here. I'm not sure why we're accepting those. And then we're basically saying for every command in Zim, we are making sure that it's not supposed to be excluded. And if we're good, then we basically say on the window, interesting, window, why did I use window there? That maybe should be capital W, which we've said is the window now. Anyway, I'll have to look at that. So we sure, there, win, window was kind of all over the place. Um, I thought we got rid of all of them and we called it a capital W for short and it just sort of shortens the amount of code that we've got. Something like that anyway. But anyway, turn the Windows command into the Zim's command or, or reference it. So that basically puts all of the Zim commands global. Okay, which is why you can go give me a new button because button is now stored on the window as a global command. So if you don't want all globals, but all globals are fine. I've been building in Zim for years and years, eight, 10 years, and I haven't really come into any problems at all with any conflicts. The only one is blob maybe uh, comes up. I haven't had it personally, but some people have used some other library for image manipulation or something as well as Zim, and they have no access to blob or their thing doesn't work anymore. That's happened, like that's shown up maybe three times in, in 10 years. It's uh, an easy solution, a known solution now. But other than that, we're a framework, and frameworks tend to use mostly only their own code uh, rather than a bunch of other libraries and stuff. Um, anyway, if you want, you can turn ZNS true, but the thing is, then you got to put Zim in front of everything. Zim, 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 Zim. And that's a lot of Zimming when you don't really have to for 99.999999% of the things <laughs> that you do. So we realize that, and that's what we put in place to solve it. And that means that Zim is more competitive with things like processing. P5.js, you don't have to put P5.js, P5.js in front of everything. Okay, you just use the command. And now Zim does that a lot easier for kids, a lot easier for everybody. So if you're a coder out there thinking you have to use namespaces, try it without the namespace first. <laughs> you make your life... Uh, a lot easier, 10% easier, I would say. 10% more fun coding with Zim if you don't use the namespace. And Zim is a lot of fun, so 10% of fun is a lot of fun still. So you don't want to lose that a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, why don't we leave it at that for an under the hood? It certainly was under the hood, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness. We, we got in in a general formatting of, uh, you know, what's in behind Zim. I am Dr. Abstract, and uh, this has been uh, an under hood. You know where we get our under the hood from? Let me show you. Dum, dum, dum. So we'll go to Zim here, and then pop into examples. 
And if we scroll on down into the code pen stuff, you're looking for a little car right here. Oh, did I miss it? Yeah, there it is. Little car. Baby, you can tune my car on code pen. Rum. Dr. Abstract. This has been uh, Under the Hood. And uh, hope hope you enjoy this series. Uh, it's for the it's not for the faint of heart, I know. If you're just learning how to code, there's lots of other uh, Zim basics and stuff like that you probably want to look at instead of this. But if you've been using Zim for a while and kind of interested in knowing how we bait how we made it or built it, how we bait it, <laughs> uh, then under the hood's for you. Take it easy. Cheers.